All right, we're back here. It's Tuesday's lecture, even though it's really Thursday. Um, we're going to go over magnetic forces on moving charges. Uh, so we, in the last few lectures, we found that uh, charges, moving charges, create magnetic fields. Um, now we're going to see that these magnetic fields created by moving charges can exert forces on, on other moving charges. Um, so we're going to review a little bit of the right-hand rules before we, we start. Um, then we're going to get into the force on uh, moving charges and wires uh, with some applications to, to mass spectrometers. Um, so this is all dealing with chapter 29, and just a reminder, uh, if you don't know already, you have a test on Monday, so uh, hopefully you're beginning to study uh, for that. Um, so there's a, we've been discussing these directions of magnetic forces, uh, and to determine them, we've been using these right-hand rules, okay? And you've probably seen enough of them to be confused right now. There's a couple different ones you can use, um, and the author sometimes is not so, well, sometimes tends to give you more than you need to know. Um, so which one to use can be very confusing. Uh, when, I, for, when I was taking the course, uh, it just, made me dizzy. So um, I would rather take a couple minutes here to review a couple of these, when to use them, um, and then we'll apply them. Um, so the most commonly used right-hand rule um, is for vectors that are given by a cross product, okay? So anytime you have a cross product of two vectors to get a third, uh, for example, the, the Beotes of Art law for a point charge, the, the magnetic field of a moving point charge, you have velocity crossed with this position vector. And that gives you a vector which is perpendicular to the two, the magnetic field direction. Um, now, there's, if you read enough of these books, you'll see that there's several different versions of the right-hand rule. Uh, just pick the one that works for you. Uh, the one that works for me the best is if I point my fingers in the direction of the first vector. Okay, so for example, A. I point my fingers in the direction of A. My right, my right hand. Point your fingers in the direction of A and have your palm pointing toward the second vector, which is B here in the top. Okay, if you do that, your thumb will give the direction of the resulting vector C. It's in the plane perpendicular to A and B, and in this case, it's pointing up. So again, point your fingers along the first vector with the palm pointing toward the second, and your thumb will point toward the result. Um, and here's an example of why the cross product is not commutative. In other words, A cross B gives you the negative of B cross A. So in this case, if we are doing B cross A, you have to point your fingers in the direction of B, and you see in this case the palm is pointing toward the second vector A, so the palm would be pointing into the screen, and in this case your thumb is pointing down. So B cross A points down. Okay. Now this is, you'll see like, it seems like a million different versions of the cross product with your hands pointing in all these different places. Just pick one and use it. This one, this one works well for me. Um, <clears throat> so this is the one, you'll use this one for these examples right here. And then we're going to show how to get the force on a moving charge and the force on the moving wire. Don't worry about these equations. We're going to, we're going to get to them shortly. But both of them involve the cross product of two vectors. Here, V cross B gives you the force. Here you have the current, the direction of the current, crossed with B gives you the force, okay? So this is the right-hand rule that I use. Uh, the author has his hand oriented a little differently. Uh, if you prefer his way, use it. But just get good with one way. Don't confuse yourself 
by trying many different. Um, there's other versions which are useful for isolated cases. Um, so we've already did this one where if you know that the current is in a given direction and we know the magnetic fields are circles, but we don't know whether they're they're pointing clockwise or counterclockwise, okay? So in other words, you know the direction, you just don't know what, which way it's going. Um, and so in this case, if we know the current direction and we want to know the magnetic field direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, you point your thumb in the direction of the current, uh, you curl your hand around the wire as if you're holding it, and the direction in which your fingers are pointing, in this case, counterclockwise, gives you the magnetic field direction. Okay. So this way is used primarily for long straight wires, whether we want to determine whether the field is clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, conversely, if you know the field direction is clockwise, we could determine that the current is up, okay, just by working backwards. So this is another version of the right-hand rule. Uh, and as if we haven't confused you enough yet, there's a third one. Um, and this is if you have a current loop um, and we want to know the direction of the magnetic field. Uh, we did this with a dipole. Um, and you just point your thumb in the direction of the I, I liked the second one. Sorry about that. I messed that up. Uh, you curl your fingers around the loop in the direction of the current, and your thumb gives you the direction of the field leaving the loop. Uh, and we did that example with current loops and magnetic dipoles. Um, so this one is used uh, for loops where you relate the current direction to the field. Uh, so I think I have them all. There's like three of them. But the most commonly used is this first one. Okay, so just again, you hear the author again, uh, gives you more than you need. I just, I use the second method, but pick the one you like and use it. Um, so now that we've reviewed the right hand rule, uh, we're going to use it a lot uh, in this lecture. Uh, so we're going to use it to get the directions and magnitudes of the forces uh, on moving charges. Uh, so quick review, uh, remember with the electric field, if there's an electric field given by some charges and then you have another charge Q, and we can determine the force on that charge if we know the field direction just by multiplying by Q, right? And if Q is positive, the force is in the direction of the field, and if Q is negative, like an electron, then the force in the field are anti-parallel. Okay. And remember, the charge doesn't have to be moving in order to experience an electric force. Okay. Now, what about charges moving in magnetic fields? Okay. It's experimentally determined, and this is in the book, we're not going to get too much into the details, that First of all, for a charge to experience a magnetic force, it has to be moving. Okay? So this is different than electric forces. Uh, and then the second is that the velocity of the charge must have some component that's perpendicular to the field. Okay. So, for example, in this first, for the first case over here to the left, if you have a charge moving in the same direction as the field, it will not experience a force. You get into the second example, if, it, if the charge is moving perpendicular to the field, it will experience a large force. Here, again, there's different cases, and we'll go over them in a minute. But So mathematically, this, these experimental statements are expressed as a cross product. And in other words, the force on a moving charge, Q, depends on the charge, on the velocity, and on the magnetic field. And it's a cross product, which is QVB times the sine of the angle between V and B. And since sine, is, sine of an angle is biggest for theta equals 90, sine of 90 is 1, the force is the biggest when the Velocity is perpendicular 
to the magnetic field. Uh, and so the force on a moving charge is expressed as a cross product, okay? QVB sine of alpha, okay? Analogous to QVC, the, the shopping channel, but with a B. Uh, so let's get the dirt, let's practice a little bit with our right hand rule here. So in this case, V and B are parallel, you get no force, okay? In this case, you have, case here, you have the velocity pointing up and the magnetic field pointing to the right. And so if you take your hand and you point your fingers along the velocity, which is upward, and you have your palm pointing to the right, which is in the direction of B, the second vector, your thumb should be pointing into the page. And so the magnetic force is into the page. Okay. Here's another example here where the velocity is to the right and the magnetic field is into the page, the force is pointing up. And you can see that by pointing your fingers in the direction of the velocity with your palm pointing down toward the direction of the field. And you should see that your thumb points upward. And so the force is upward. Uh, and we can go on and on and continue the fun, but I think I think you get it now. Um, so let's try if we're going to try a few examples here. Um, so in this in these pictures, as is always, the X means that the magnetic field is going into the page, and the dot means that the magnetic field points out of the page. So what we want to do is show. Uh, that the forces on a positive charge and a negative charge are, are as sketched here. Okay, so here you have a positive charge moving to the right. The magnetic field is pointing into the page. We apply the right hand rule. You point your fingers in the direction of V with your palm pointing toward the direction of the magnetic field, which is into the, into the screen and you see that the force is pointing upward. So a positive charge is going to be bent upward to the upward in the, in the page here, in, in the screen. Um, now, since you have, if you look at the definition, the force is Q times V cross B. If Q is positive, then the force is in the same direction as V cross B. If Q is negative here, so in other words, if we have a negative sign, then that means the force is anti-parallel to V cross B. It's, it's negative. And so in this case, the force would be downward. Now, I find it easiest just to get the direction of V cross B, which is the force that would be on a positive charge. And then if Q is negative, you just flip it at the end. Okay, otherwise your hands are going to be like all over the place and you're going to look foolish and you're going to mess it up. So it's easiest just to get the force on the positive charge and then flip the sign of the force if it's negative. Okay. And so um, here's the summary for the force of a moving charge Q uh, in a magnetic field. Okay, so the magnitude is equal to the magnitude of Q times the mag the speed, the magnitude of V, times the magnitude of B times the sine of alpha. And so this gives the magnitude of the force. And these are all positive values when we're getting the negative. Okay, that magnitude. Okay. So the direction is, is obtained by using the right hand rule. So find the direction of V cross B. And if the charge is positive, that, that this will give you F. And if the charge is negative, just get V cross B and then flip your force, flip the sign at the end. So there's times often where it's gonna be easier to just solve this in Cartesian coordinates instead of uh, trying to use the right hand rule. So and here's one case. So suppose that you have a proton, positive charge, and it's moving at 40 at us in this direction I. So the proton is moving 
in a magnetic field, which is along the x direction, and the, for, the it's moving in some angle in the x z plane here. Okay, and we want to find out what the direction or what the and blank in here, what the force, magnitude, and direction are. Okay, now we could do this if we just use the magnitude of the speed, the magnitude of the field, which we know, and we know they're at an angle 45 degrees, and so we could just calculate it using QVB times the sine of the angle, and we could use the right-hand rule right, by just taking V, pointing your fingers in V, and we could point with the palm pointing in the direction of B, and you would see that it points in the plus y direction, okay? But we're going to, as practice, uh, express it in Cartesian coordinates, so you know how to do it this way as well. Okay, so the first thing we need to do in both of these cases is we need to express v in terms of the coordinates, okay? And if you look at the picture here, the, the velocity as a component v cosine of 45 along the plus x direction. So we write v cosine of 45 along the i hat, which is the plus x direction. And it has a component v sine of theta along the plus z direction. So we write it as v sine of 45 along the k direction, which is the z. Okay. And then we cross that with the magnetic field and the magnetic fields pointing along the x direction. Okay. Now we need to take this cross product. So you have i hat cross i hat, two vectors along the same direction. Cross product is zero. So the first term is zero. And then you've got a k cross i. And you can do the right hand rule here and you can see that that is equal to j along the y direction. And so in this case, we get that the field, the force is q times v times b, and we plug in our numbers, and it's in the j direction, the y direction, which is denoted by j hat, and it's 5.7 times 10 to the negative 13 newtons. Okay. Now in part b, this is a little bit easier. The velocity only has one component. Um, we're going to apply the same uh, formula uh, to get the field here. Um, and now you've got V, which is in the negative Y direction. So we write it as Q times V negative J cross V in the I direction. And you get negative J cross I is K. And we plug it in and we get 8.0 times 10 to the negative 13 newtons. Okay. Now, when in doubt, you know, these are these J cross I's, all this can be confusing. As one check, let's check here. So point your, try this, point your fingers in the direction of V with your palm toward B. And you will see that the, um, the force is pointing along the plus z direction upward. So we've got a little bit of right hand rule practice. Uh, now let's go into the motion. We're going to get into one specific example, which is centripetal motion uh, caused by a, a magnetic field exerted by on a charged particle. Uh, so if you recall, um, the electric field is either the force in an elect particle moving along an electric field will either accelerate or decelerate the particle, right? So in other words, electric forces can change the kinetic energy. They can change the speed of the particles and they can do work on it, okay? Now, the magnetic force, if you look here back at our equation, the magnetic force is always perpendicular to the velocity, right? Because it's perpendicular to V and perpendicular to V. And if the force is perpendicular to the velocity, it has no the velocity has no component along the direction of the force, and the force cannot do work on the particles moving. It cannot it cannot change their speed. Okay, it can change their direction, 
but it can't change the speed of the particle. Uh, and that's pretty, that's similar. If, remember the tension force back in 1150. Remember, centripetal forces can bend the particle's motion in a circle, but they can't change its speed. And so that's the same thing. If you place a charged particle in a magnetic field, you will get a centripetal force. The force is always perpendicular to the velocity, and that will result in the particle moving in a circular orbit. So magnetic fields can only change directions of the charges. They can't change the speed. Um, and we're going to get into a special case of that in, right now. So if the velocity and the magnetic field direction are perpendicular, then the angle between them is 90 degrees, and the force is just QVB times sine of 90. Okay. So that's the magnitude of the force. Okay. So let's look here. If we stick the particle in a magnetic field here, and the force is perpendicular to the velocity, the velocity and the magnetic field are perpendicular. So 90 degrees is the angle between V and B, and the force is equal to QVB. Okay. Now we remember from 1150 that it's a centripetal force, and so the centripetal force is the mass times the centripetal acceleration. So the, the magnetic force is toward the center of the circle. It's a centripetal force. Its magnitude is QVB, and that's equal to the mass times the centripetal acceleration. And we can solve that for the radius, and you can determine that the radius that this charged particle will move in depends on the speed, V, depends on the magnetic field, B, and it also depends on the ratio of the charge to mass. And you say, okay, well, why are we doing this? Okay, this has a lot of examples in science, and one of them is in a mass spectrometer, which is used to measure the masses of different comp components, because then it can tell you the chemical composition. Um, so this is what's called a mass spectrometer. Um, it gives you the spectrum of the different masses in atomic mass units when you send a gas or into this mass spectrometer, and from it we can identify the chemical components that are present in the gas. So here's carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, I mean carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, water vapor, hydrogen, fluorine. We can get it from what's called the mass spectrum. Okay, and this relies on our equation here that if you send charged particles into a magnetic field, the magnetic field, the magnetic force is a centripetal force, and it will bend them into circular motion. And the radius depends on the mass of the particle. So let's look at that here. So here's how it works. Uh, you have a source of ions, and what you have is you, you basically, in other words, you basically vaporize your substance and then you apply a strong electric field which will ionize the substance. And so you get particles that have a charge of one. In other words, you rip an electron off of each of these atoms, and you've got particles, ions, with charge one. Okay. And so these positive charges are accelerated by a large potential difference. Here's the negative plate going upward, and they're going to be accelerated to really high speeds. Okay, and when they get to this point, all of the potential energy, which is the charge times the potential difference, is converted into kinetic energy. So if we know the original voltage between the two plates, we, can de we know what the speed of these particles is when they reach this point. So we know V, and then they're going to enter a magnetic field. Okay. And so if the field is pointing out of the paper, 
and the velocity is pointing upward, you can apply the right-hand rule and the positive charges. Your thumb will point to the right, and these particles, these plus charges, these ions will get bent to the right. Okay? And the radius of their orbit, they're all coming out with the same speed, and the magnetic field B is the same for all of them. And they all have the same charge, which is one is plus one, because they've all had an electron ripped out of it. The radius depends solely on the mass, and the mass depends solely on the chemical composition. And so the different masses, the different types of gases, each with a different atomic mass, will get bent into different radii. Okay. Now we have a couple choices here. We can, if we want to determine all the different masses present, we can either move the detector and we can scan it along this line and stop at each radius and measure if there's particles there, then that's a certain mass. But more often what's done is you can vary the magnetic field strength. Okay. And if we do that, and we solve for mass here, as a function of magnetic field strength, at each field strength, it will be such that a given mass will have the radius necessary to reach the detector. And so we can plot this and we can get the different mass spectrum. Okay. Now, more commonly what happens is um, you can solve this by plugging in for velocity. We can relate the velocity to the voltage by conservation of energy, and you plug that in, and that the mass is related to the voltage, which we can measure, and to the magnetic field strength, which we measure, and therefore we can, we can determine the mass. Um, and here's some spectrum. Um, here's a, the mass of the different isotopes of krypton. So we ionize the krypton, we put it in a mass spectrometer, we keep adjusting the magnetic field, and then you get at certain radii, which correspond to certain masses, you get large signals. In other words, there's a lot of particles that have that mass. And you, you get a plot, basically, and it's telling you the isotopes of krypton. So this is an example of using the motion of particles in, in uniform magnetic fields to determine the mass spectrum of the gas substance, and then that tells you the chemical compositions. And this is what's called a, a mass spectrometer. You chemists may have heard of this. Um, so if we know the forces on moving charges, and we know that moving charges give rise to a current, we can write this formula in terms of the current. Suppose we know the current in a wire is given by I. Okay, and we can do that by writing if the wire has a length L, the velocity is, the speed is equal to length over time. This the time it takes to go a length L. So we can write V is L over T, and then we can move the T so it's underneath the Q, and Q over T is the current, and we get a different form of this equation for the moving charge in terms of a current. So in other words, if we know the current in the wire and we know the length of the wire, we get a different form of this which tells us the force on a current carrying wire. Okay. And I L B sine theta is just I L cross B. Okay, so this is the force exerted by a magnetic field on a wire. Okay, and it has the same right-hand rule. Okay, you take your hands, you put your fingers along the direction of the current with your palm pointing toward the magnetic field, and the force is the direction of your thumb. And in this case, it would, it would be upward. So let's do a few examples and then a demo here. Um, so... You have the same current in each of these wires, case A, case B, case C, case D. And the only thing that's different is the direction of the current. Okay, And the question is, for which one of these cases will you get the largest magnetic force, and for which one do you get the smallest? 
Okay, well, we know that you have the largest force when the current and the magnetic field are perpendicular to one another, right? Because sine of 90 degrees is 1. So which cases are they perpendicular? Well, case D they are. Tape the currents into the, into the screen. Field is upward. Angle between them is 90. So you're going to get a maximum force for D. You're also going to get a maximum force here for B. So those two are tied. Those are the biggest. You're going to get the smallest force when the current and the magnetic field are parallel or anti-parallel because sine of 0 or sine of 180 is 0. You get no force. Well, that's case C, so C is the smallest. And then case A is somewhere in between, and so that's the second smallest. Okay. So this case, you're just uh, ranking them, and it's solely by using this equation here that the force is maximum when they're perpendicular. Okay. So this is a good multiple choice type question for an exam. Uh, anyway, now let's um, now that we know the force on one wire, let's uh, calculate the force exerted by two wires on one another. Okay. And before we do that, I got my pages mixed up here. Let's let's do it. Let's stop and look at a, a YouTube video right here. Is pointing up, and then I have a big, uh, well, copper tube, which is connected to the wires here and there. When I connect these here, electricity will flow through this guy, through the red, through the copper tube, and then up through ground, and then back home. So we'll have electricity flowing this way, magnetic field pointing today, and there. Designed to take advantage of what might be a once in a Okay, so you should be able to go back in that video um, and you should be able to, if you know the direction of the current and you know where the north poles and the south pole of the magnet are, then you can get the direction of the magnetic field. You should be able to predict the direction of, of the force on the water. Um, so now what happens if you have two wires, okay? So in this case, let's just take a simple case in which they're moving parallel to one another. The wires are parallel, and they have current. there's a current in each wire. So the top wire has a current I1, and the bottom wire has a, wire, has a current I2, okay? And the claim is that they will exert an attractive force one and one another if the currents are in the same direction and that they will exert a repulsive force on one another if the currents are in opposite direction. So let's see here. So remember that the current in the, the lower wire, let's just start with I2. That's going to create a magnetic field, right? The, the magnetic field will be circles around the, around the loop, just like the current through wire one will create a magnetic field, which are circles around that loop. And we want to know whether that we know that the magnitude is equal to mu naught times the current over two pi times the separation. Okay. So in other words, Current I2 in the lower wire will create a field B2, which is mu naught times I2 over 2 pi D. That creates a magnetic field at the location of wire 1. And if you take the right-hand rule for currents, and I, I put it over here again, so cur take your thumb, point it along the direction of I2, and curl your right hand. Okay, And the direction in which you curl gives the direction of the magnetic field, okay? So if you do that, you will see that at wire one, your fingers are coming out of the screen, okay? The field due to current to current two is coming out of the screen at wire one. And so B2 points out of the page, okay? And you can do the same thing if you take current one, that's going to the right, and you do the right-hand rule there, and you'll see that if you curl your hand in the direction of the current, 
you'll see that your hand is going back into the screen at the location of charge two, okay? And so that field points into the screen. And they both have a magnitude equal mu naught times the current over two pi d. So what we wanna do now is we wanna calculate that that gives rise to a force on each of the wires. So we're going to calculate the force on wire one, which is due to wire two, and then get the magnitude and the direction. And by Newton's third law, that tells us that the force on two due to one is the same magnitude, but just the opposite sign. So we'll just calculate the force on one right now. Okay, so if you do that, we get that the force on current wire one is I1 times the length of the wire times the magnetic field strength B2 times the sine of the angle between I1 and B2. And, and they're 90 degrees because I1 is pointing to the right and the magnetic field's coming out of the screen. So theta is 90, sine of 91. So this is the magnitude, okay? And what does the right-hand rule tell us? Well, let's, to get the direction, take your fingers and point them along I1 your, of your right hand with your palm pointing out of the page, out of the screen. And you should see that that force on one due to two is downward. It's an attractive force. Okay. Now, as the last step, we're going to plug in what B2 is. B2 is equal to mu naught times I2 over 2 pi D. And we get the equation for the force of two parallel wires on one another. It depends on the length, the product of the two currents, and then with the distance D in the denominator. Um, and you should try on your own uh, using the right-hand rule and you will see that the magnetic field at wire two if due to one is down into the screen and that gives rise to a force on wire two which is upward. And so in other words, if the currents are in the same direction, these two wires are attracting one another and you can go showing through the right hand rule, I encourage you to do this because it could be on a test. If the currents are going in the opposite direction, you will see that the forces that they exert on one another, the wires will repel one another. Um, so it ends up with a pretty simple result that currents moving in the same direction will attract one another, the wires. And if the currents are moving in opposite directions, the wires will repel. And the magnitude of the force in both cases depends on the product of the currents, the length of the wire, and on the distance d. Okay, so this is the force exerted by two wires. Um, so let's end with an example. Um, suppose we have three wires here, and they're all parallel, okay, and they're all separated by two centimeters. Okay. And they're carrying currents in different directions. So one and three are carrying currents to the right. Two is carrying a current to the left. Okay. And so let's use the fact that if the currents, we know the magnitudes of the forces. So for any pair of wires, the force depends on the product of the currents and the distance between them. So we're going to apply this formula for each pair. And we know the magnitudes and we know the set of the currents and we know the separation. So we can calculate the magnitudes of all these forces. Okay. We know also by the directions that one and two will be attract, will be repelled by one another because their currents are in the opposite direction. Two and three will be repelled by one another, but one and three will be attracted. Okay. So what we want to do to calculate the total force on, on each wire, for example, wire one, is we need to calculate the sum of the forces on that wire due to the other two wires, adding their magnitudes and their directions. Okay, now I'm gonna choose the plus y direction to be upward in this plane, which means the, y, the current's going along the plus x direction, plus y is upward. So 
let's calculate all the magnitudes first. Okay, the force of wire two on wire one depends on the current of wire one, the current of wire two, the lengths, and on the separation D um, between them. And so we plug that in. All the currents are 10 amps, so 10 amps times 10 amps. The length of the wire is a half a meter. Mu naught is 4 pi, it should be 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7. Um, and then you divide by, oh, I get it. He divided 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 divided by 2 pi gives 2, okay? And you divide that by the distance, which is 2 centimeters. And you get that the magnitude of this force is 5 times 10 to the negative 4 newtons, okay? Now, the forces between 2 and 3 are also the same magnitude as this because they both involve 10 amp currents and the wires are separated by 2 centimeters. And so all of these forces have the same magnitude of 5 times 10 to the negative 4 newtons. The only magnitude that's different is the force between 1 and 3 because that's double the separation. That's 4 centimeter sep separation. And so when you plug in numbers for that, you get that the force is only half, okay? Now we're going to add them, and we have to add, we have to be careful with the directions here. So let's calculate the total force on one, on wire one, is the force on one due to two, so the force of two on one, plus the force of three on one, okay? Now the force of wire three of two on one is in the plus j direction. It's attract, it's an attractive force, so it's pointing upward. Okay. And the force of wire three on one is downward. Downward is attractive, upward is repulsive. I'm sorry. So the force of two on one is pointing upward. In other words, one is being repelled by two. Which, and the force of three on one is pointing downward, which means one is being attracted to three. And you add these up, and you get that the force exerted on, on wire one is 2.5 times 10 to the negative four newtons, and it's upward. It's a net repulsive force because the repulsive force due to wire two is greater than the attractive force due to wire three. And you can do these for both of them. So now we do on wire two, okay? Wire two is going to experience a repulsive force due to one, because they're in the opposite directions. So that will be downward. Wire two will experience a repulsive force due to three, because they're in opposite directions, the currents. Repulsive means upward. Forces are the same magnitude and they cancel, and so wire two experiences no force. And you can do the same thing, wire three experiences forces due to one and two, and you get a net repulsive force, which is downward. Uh, so you should be able to apply this equation for the force due to two parallel wires, and you should be able to get your signs right by knowing that if the wires are in the same direction currents, if the currents are in the same direction, the force is attractive, and if it's in the opposite, it's repulsive. Okay. So I did another worked example here, which we can do uh, in office hours, but you, if you want, uh, otherwise go through it. Uh, we're going to finish the chapter tomorrow, and the only thing we have left to do is forces and torques on current loops, and that has applications to motors. Um, so here's your learning objectives. Um, you should be able to apply the right-hand rules to relate the directions of moving charges and currents and the fields and the forces. You should be able to calculate the force exerted, magnitude and direction of charges moving in magnetic fields. You should be able to apply the centripetal force formula for a charged particle going in circular motion in a magnetic field to relate the radius to the charge and the mass. Uh, and you should be able to calculate forces 
on current carrying wires one and two wires and three on this case. So should be able to do that for the exam on Monday and we will finish chapter 29 tomorrow. Uh, this is a long chapter. Uh, so go home, get some rest, and we'll see you tomorrow.